you go ahead and start. All right. All right, it's 6.15. We'll call this meeting to order. Is everybody taking a chance to look over our minutes from our last meeting? If so, do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. All right, got a motion to have a second. Second. All right, uh, all in favor? I'm going to turn it over to Janet and let her introduce our newest member to the... All right. You can introduce both of them. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a new Main Street Tourism Coordinator, Shannon Grogan. Hey, Shannon. She'll be keeping me and Miss Sharon in line. Um, is Ron doing number one on the? Uh, or y'all got to go through the other stuff first, right? Do what now? Have we, are we doing a financial report? We can. <laughs> and financial then Ron, report, from Ron then, Johnson yeah. is our planning and zoning specialist, right. and he's here tonight. All right. All right. The financial report's nothing to it. There's just um, about $10 worth of interest on the account for the last month, so that's the only activity. Any questions from Carl? Mm -hmm. All right, Janet, now do you want to introduce them? We're at that point now. <laughs> so are we having Ron doing the discussion on benefits of remodeling downtown buildings? Is that what we're having? That's Bill. Bill? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Okay. So Ron uh, Johnson, come to the mic. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Ron Johnson, as uh, Janet said. I'm the planning and zoning specialist for the city, so I handle uh, the board applications that go before the uh, city council and the planning commission, as well as the HPC uh, for certificates of appropriateness. Um, I have a, sh a short PowerPoint for you guys uh, to try to go over some of the um, tax credit programs that are available to us. Uh, some of them are uh, unique to uh, programs that we had to apply for <clears throat> um, and be granted from the state, uh, DCA programs, et cetera. Down at the bottom of that screen, there's a green, share the screen. Thank you very much. 
you know, you'd think the millennial in the room would uh, get that, huh? But I guess not. <laughs> All right, so um, if you could just make that full screen for me, Janet, if you don't mind. Oh, um, yeah, uh, go up to slideshow at the top. And from beginning all the way on the left. There you go. I wish I had a clicker. I had the clicker. I know, I forgot. I forgot about the clicker. All right, so uh, you can go ahead to the next screen. All right. Um, so we there's a number of different types of incentives. Um, the I guess the goal really of this presentation is to just educate everybody. Um, this was an education for even myself on the sheer number of tax credits and uh, loans and grants that we either administer or um, are administered by the state that we could take advantage of. So I tried to include as many of of these credits as possible. I just listed the three here. Um, that are probably the most pertinent to us and ones that would more than likely be utilized by a business that would like to relocate to Villarica. Um, and you can go to the next one. I need a signal. That symbol. All right, so uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, run through really quick the grants that um, you guys are probably really, um, probably pretty familiar with these grants already, but uh, the first grant here is the Boost Grant. Um, these are really uh, geared towards small businesses, uh, and they're uh, micro grants. Uh, so $100 to $1,000. Um, it's for uh, financial assistance to any um, business, and it's not a match that's required. And the grants are dispersed on a quarterly basis, from what I understand. Um, so this this is a grant that is utilized, as you know, uh, the Main Street utilizes it and gives it out all throughout the year. Next. Got a question. Does the size of the grant, is that dependent upon the size of the project or, you know, what determines 100 or 1,000? Well, it's a maximum of 1,000. Right. So if you have a, like, we just did uppercuts on last year that are awnings, and they were like 986 dollars, we gave whoever her contract was 986 dollars. On the mic, sorry. So, so basically, if, if the cost of the of the contract, whatever that happens to be, is over a thousand dollars. You would try to give them a thousand dollars max grant. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can go to the next one. You can go ahead. Next one. Oh, there you go. No, I got it. Um, the facade grant program, another one that's administered through the Main Street, that's up to five thousand dollars. This is actually DDA. This is actually oh, done sorry. through DDA. DDA, yeah. I apologize. Through DDA, uh, and it provides up to five thousand dollars in grants um, for exterior improvements uh, to the property. So um, it can be uh, taken by the uh, tenant of the building. Um, or a property owner, um, and it's a way to help us improve the buildings as we have them now, um, because I, I do understand that there have been people who have been interested in um, this grant uh, in the past. I'm not sure how many you guys have issued or not. So we did one for Amy Brown State Farms office, yes. and we did one for um, Southern Homes and Land Realty. Security mm -hmm. finance too, didn't we? So the, uh, I don't th I don't know about security finance. I can't remember if that we did that one or not. I don't think so. So they would have to go through the Historic Preservation Commission if it's something that's inside of a district right now, which we'll go over um, that as well. I have the district maps in here. Um, and it's, for this one, there's, of course, the one-for-one -one, uh, match. Uh, the next is the uh, EIG program, Exterior Improvement Grant, uh, which is similar to the last one, uh, but the maximum grant award is 2500 and uh, there's no cash match. Again, what determines the amount, the size of the project? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, those are the only three grant app grants that we actually administer here that I'm aware of. Um, now, as far as loans are concerned, there's two different types of loans as well. Um, both of them seem to be almost identical to one another. <laughs> Uh, so we have the Georgia Cities Foundation uh, Revolving Loan Fund. That's to a $250,000 maximum. Ooh. Oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there we go. 
Sorry. Okay. And um, the repayment period is uh, 10 years, but not to exceed 15 years. I'm not sure what that five-year change or why that, that would be, but typically they're 10 years. Um, yeah, we've never administered one of these. Yes, probably an amortization. We have. Yes, we have. To 15. We have. Which one is it? Who? The, the one where Andy works in, in, in that building. Oh, okay. We did that. Which one is that Gosh, one? Gosh, it's been five, five large, 15 years ago. Before building. my time. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, way before your time. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, in eligible projects, real estate acquisitions, building rehabs, new construction, green space, parks, et cetera, um, can be utilized for this. So uh, typically it will be a, a municipality that will be applying for it, but also businesses as well, right? So, Correct. So you can go to the next. Before you go on, Ron, mm -hmm. excuse me, the, the way that works for those who weren't here when we did it, it's a 40-40-20 loan. If the developer or the buyer of the, of, of the property can wind up with 20% of the cost involved in it, then a bank will take first position at 40% and the Georgia Cities Foundation will take 40% in a second position. So uh, it's, it's really a no-brainer for a bank to go this route because okay. they they only have a 40% uh, investment in it, right. but, but, but have the first position if something goes wrong. So, so the state actually takes the biggest risk right here. The, the developer, a 20% risk, the, the bank, a 40%, and then the state, 40%, but that's a second position for them. Okay, hmm. got it. All right, so the last loan here is the Georgia Department of Community Affairs Downtown Development um, Revolving Loan Fund. Uh, this is almost identical completely to the other loan fund. I'm not really sure why they would have two of the same exact programs, but um, when looking at the criteria for the two, it, they were identical. So, uh, I mean. I can explain that too. Okay. Go ahead. They work together hand in hand. Either one does it or the other does it, but they don't do them simultaneously. Okay. So then technically someone can't come in and apply for both of those loans Correct. because there will be a, first, a second and first lien holder positions that each of these individual ones would have to take, or is it just that you can't, you, you can't utilize one if there's another? I actually dealt with both of them when we did this one over here. And they will tell you that we we work together, and if we have money, we'll be happy to work with you. If they have money, then you're going to have to go see them because they have revolving loan funds themselves. And if it hasn't been repaid in a timely manner, then their uh, resources dry up too. So, so that is, that's the way they do that. Okay. Yeah. So this, now we're going to get into our um, historic uh, or into all of our tax credit programs that are available to us, um, and there are quite the number. Um, you know, I didn't even—I was telling Janet just before this that I—I I never would have imagined that there was the sheer number of tax credits as I thought. You know, there's—we always hear about housing tax credits, we always hear about historic tax credits, but there's far more than that in Georgia. Um, and they're, uh, they're, some of them overlap each other, some of them can be utilized together, um, but the state has so many different rules on the utilization and combination of these different tax credits uh, that it truly is up to each individual situation. Um, but the first one that I wanna go over is the state historic tax credits. That's not to be confused with the federal historic tax credits. Um, the state tax credits for historic properties, they would have to be uh, either on the uh, national or the state register of historic places, uh, or it ha would have to be eligible to be on it. Um, so there, if you, we went through like a, a pre-application process, for example, through uh, the state SHPO office um, for a district or potential uh, listing of a building, that will qualify if they come back positive uh, on uh, a recommendation to move forward with a district, for example. Um, but any building that is to be renovated under a historic tax credit from the state would have to follow the Secretary of Interior standards, the federal standards anyway. 
uh, which is the same with um, our historic or, or our um, historic preservation commission here. They also follow the Secretary of Interior standards through our new design guidelines that were enacted last year. Um, so they're pretty much the same. Uh, so with the historic tax credits, uh, another thing is the um, the project also has to be. It, they can't. You can't utilize this tax credit, for example, with um, uh, certain uh, certain other tax credits. The federal one is the most restrictive one, um, which we're going to go over the federal one next. Um, but that one, for example, you can't utilize with the rural zone pro uh, program, for example. But for state historic tax credits, you can. Um, so if someone wants to approach us, they want to buy a building, they want to utilize the rural zone, we can also tell them to check out the state historic tax credits uh, as well. You can go to the next one. Is there a percent associated with these taxes? Like, like a project overall had, uh, say, a half a million dollars value. Is there a, there a percent of that as tax credit? Um, well, on this screen, we'll no, be sorry. able to... Um, see here uh, the types of state historic tax credits. So there's two. There's uh, the state preferential property tax assessment for rehab, uh, re rehabilitated historic properties, which would freeze the county property tax assessment uh, for a total of eight years. Um, and the owner must increase the fair market value of the building by 50 to 100 um, percent. And that depends on the different uses. They have a whole number of different uh, uses for commercial uh, that it would have to go off of. And uh, then there's the second one, uh, which is the state income tax credit for rehab historical uh, historic properties. And uh, that is the one that you, you hear about a lot that people actually take. Um, obviously, the freezing of the taxes is, is great as well, but a lot of people have hurdles with increasing value up to, you know, 50 to 100 percent as well. Um, so if the, if the building's not completely bombed out and it actually has a use that's there now and it's, it's utilized and it's kept up, but someone wants to make additional changes to the interior of the building uh, to increase value, the, the chances of that getting over 50 to 100 percent is really low. So um, the second one here, if you could see, it says the Georgia State Income Tax Credit Program for Rehab Historic Properties allows eligible participants to apply for a state income tax credit equaling 25% of qualifying rehab expenses capped at $100,000 uh, for personal residences and $300,000, $5 million or $10 million for all other properties. So that would depend on if it's uh, industrial property, uh, if it's a commercial uh, property, the type of commercial property that it is, uh, size of the building, they have a whole list, laundry list of criteria. You can go ahead. So this is the eligible area for this, um, for these state tax credits. It's only on the north side of the, uh, of the downtown area because the south side is not designated at all right now. It's not designated local, state, or national. And the north side, um, as I actually um, kind of alluded to on the phone with Bill Taylor last week, the north side it was designated in 2002 uh, on the national and the state registry, but uh, I can't find actual any documentation for a local designation. So we would have to correct that uh, by doing an entire new local designation for that area. And keep in mind that's uh, very important because a local designation is, is what, uh, what in, empowers and enacts a certificate of appropriateness process. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this, that if we don't have a local district, but we have a state and a federal, then how can we continue with a certificate of appropriateness process? Um, so what do you need there, Ronald? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I contacted the lady that did most of the legwork for this. Mm -hmm. She thinks she can find it in the files of her business. Do you, do you need that type of documentation? Or if we have it, that would save a lot of time yeah, sure um, and a lot of confusion into our process. And, uh, you know, it, I would please encourage you to, to uh, try to help me get that if it, if it is out there. I, ha I looked back through uh, some agendas. I didn't see anything for local, but I, I couldn't go all the way back to 2002. 
and uh, there's nothing on our file systems for that. So um, if it, it may very well be there, um, but it's just I don't I don't have it. So um, if it doesn't show its face within you know the next several months, then I'm gonna have to come to go to city council and and uh, designate it again locally. But the national and the state still stands though. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, can you utilize federal or state tax credits uh, programs? Yes, you can. Um, can you layer them? Yes, you can. Um, you could see actually on the screen here uh, the two different types of federal tax credits. One is actually for buildings that are eligible to be or, or, or listed rather on the National Register of Historic Places, the National Register. Um, now that's a higher credit that's going to be for 20 percent of rehab costs but the second one is 10 percent is a 10 percent credit and that's for buildings that are considered um non uh, non-historic or non uh complementary to uh to uh, the district that's surrounding it so if i have a, a 60s ranch that's in the middle of a historic pro a historic district then um yeah, i would still be eligible for a 10 percent tax credit even though though my building doesn't um, contribute to the district itself. It's a non-contributing property. So all of the, all the buildings on the, virtually all the buildings on the north side of the track, from here down to North Avenue, north Avenue. Mm -hmm. are are within this district. They are yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The reason we did that back in 2002 was to get what is now the loft apartments in a position to where it made it financially feasible to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and so there have been other rehabs done up and down through there that took advantage of that too, but not to the extent that those loft apartments were. Uh, so uh, if, if a building downtown mm -hmm. that, uh, that is, say, in no use or misuse, whichever one you would say, and it needs a new roof, it needs new floors, it needs new plumbing, it needs new wiring to, to bring it all up to code. It wouldn't take it long to double the cost or the, the value of it. Now that value, is that the value in the tax books right now? Or is that value what somebody pays for it when they buy it to rehab? Specifically with, with which tax credit though? With, uh... Well. You said it had to up up the value by what fifty to two hundred percent. Yes, state. Can you can go back to that one um, for state. Yes, um, and that's the value. The uh, let me take a look. More. I think it's one more. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah it's fair market value. Mm -hmm. Fifty to one hundred percent. Now, is that using the tax value on the county records? Um, or is, it, is that the amount one would have to pay for it to buy it? I'll have to find out, but my first gut, intent, uh, <clears throat> gut thought here is uh, when they indicate fair market value, um, isn't, I believe that's what the assessor uses, right? Fair market value. So, that's a, so I guess the answer to your question would be yes. They would, they would utilize um, the fair market value of the property as indicated by the assessor. Okay. Yeah. From the tax records itself, mm -hmm. and if somebody could buy it at that price, whatever that price happened to be, and then spend that much more on it to bring it up to standards, then mm -hmm. he would certainly beat that fifty to two hundred percent. They can, yeah. Okay. Would the the value then be from the tax assessor or from his personal financial records of what he had to spend on? Well, the assessor takes. Oh, I'm sorry, for what he had to spend as far as not just the acquisition, you're saying? Right. I have to find out. I'm, I'm hesitant to say one way or the other um, with that. That, uh, that that's, some, that's a tax, uh, the, mind you, you know, being that these are two different types of state tax credits, that tax credit, the first one, is one that I, um, I don't believe that I've seen um, or ever had to deal with here. Um, I can't think of one property that has had to ever apply for that or anything. Um, just the second one is the one that you see most of the time. So I'll, I'll have to find that out and let you know. It's a good question, though.
Okay. But they only indicate fair market value on almost any any of the state paperwork. That's they don't say how they reach that or anything. So okay. that's an intricate question. Okay. The rehab expense is capped at one hundred thousand dollars for a personal res residence, three hundred five million or ten million for all other properties. How is it capped at three different levels for all of, all of the properties? Um. Well. Qual first, first there's qualifying rehab expenses in general and what that means. And based on the type of property that it is, um, that would fluctuate, right? It would be different from a, per a, a personal residence than a commercial building. There's many different types of commercial buildings. Um, so it really depends on, they have a whole, like I was saying before, they have a whole list of criteria um, for people to follow and where their buildings fall into. So. Um, for commercial properties, uh, there, it's, it really ranges on the square footage. It ranges on the, um, how many, uh, business or, or, you know, uses are actually in the building, how many apartments, if there's like multiple apartments in the building, if there's multiple storefronts in the building, all of that comes into play. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can vastly range. It's not like one set for everyone. Sounds like if anybody was interested in doing this, they would have to go to Carl down here to get get his tax opinion on it. No, no, no. Good Ron, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but that uh, it is not straightforward, is it? No, unfortunately, you're going to see as we go on. It's not really straightforward for a lot of these, um, you know. Unfortunately, and how many and which ones of these can be combined with others? I tried looking. Um, to see, does it matter, for example, if someone wants to go f and get a job tax credit uh, in addition to a s uh, state historic tax credit, for example? One is obviously dealing with people, and the other one is dealing with structures. And the answer is yes, you can do that, for example. Um, but when it comes to rural zone, it becomes a lot less clear on the different types uh, that you can and cannot combine with them because they do overlap. There is a job tax credit program under the rural zone um, but then there's multiple different ones for the state as well, and which ones can be combined? Does it make sense to combine them? Can you just like can you keep layering them up over the same employee that you hired? Um, and it doesn't appear that you can do that, but I can't find it anywhere in any of the state's paperwork. So I actually already sent an email out to Sherry Bennett uh, to find out. So um, you can go to the third one. Well, um, we weren't really talking about the number of people that, that would be hired for a rehab we're just talking about the cost of rehabbing and and making it suitable for a commercial or a residential uh, location mm -hmm. and uh, usually those are, are associated with the industrial locations aren't they the number of people are good, that are going to be hired over the next five it can years. be but the state also has uh, telecommunications industries anything that's considered like a vital um, te uh, technology related use um, it doesn't necessarily have to be industrial in nature. It could be office-related as well. Okay. okay, so you you would be certainly willing to work with somebody if they were interested in uh, doing this? Um, for uh, historic tax credits? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Plus all, uh, all of the grants that may be available, you know, every incentive that's out there you will you'd be willing to work with somebody to maximize to find the answers and to maximize, maximize it, it. Yeah. so okay all right janet and i are kind of a uh, uh we call ourselves a dream team so yeah so ron and i are the dream team on rural zone of course i oversee the uh exterior improvement grant through main street and the boost grant um through main street you guys handle facade so uh, we will work for you then, and Ron and I work with you guys on uh, the rules on portion of it. Yeah. But anything to do with the story preservation, I'm going to leave that in Ron's Yeah, um, you know, there's, I don't want to step on Janet's toes, too, because I know she, has, she administers a lot of these programs already. But when it comes to state and federal tax credits, that's something that we don't, um, we don't actually administer through the Main Street office. Um, we don't administer it really at all. It's up to the individual person to find out. But I would, of course, to, to move the goal forward, I would want to work with um, somebody who's coming in to try to make sure that they maximize everything that they can get. 
Okay, so as far as grants are concerned, just pure grants, mm -hmm. the max would be five from the DDA, a thousand from Main Street. Five or a thousand for the boost grant. The exterior improvement is a max of twenty five hundred. Okay, mm -hmm. so that'd be eighty eighty five hundred dollars in grants we're talking about here. Am I correct? Correct. But the Main Street Board will ultimately vote. Um, I don't know that we would you know, give all three to the same, but certainly that's up to, I'll let Carl speak yeah, to that. The, the, the boost board. grant and the exterior improvement grant are really for two different things. The right. boost grant's mainly for interior. interior equipment, things to improve the business, whereas the exterior improvement grant's for the outside, similar to the DDA's facade grant. So the, a lot of times the Main Street exterior improvement grant will be put together with the DDA facade grant to do the outside. Correct. So those two would go together for $7,500. But then the $1,000 boost grant is really for other things um, like equipment and inside of the store. Because I believe Amy but Brown's it could building. Yeah, it could apply. Uh, yeah. Amy Brown's building, I think in Southern Homes Land Realty, uh, Land Realty we combined both of those, I think. The exterior, exterior improvement, improvement grant and, and the facade. DDA. Yep. yep. Correct. Yep, we did. Um, I think we're back one. Back one? Okay. Uh, back one more. <laughs> Gosh, one more. Okay, there you go. Um, all right, so uh, separating out the 20% grant for a moment, um, that, or 20% um, tax credit, rather. And it, one thing is uh, it's important to note that any expenditure that's incurred by the taxpayer before the start of the 24 month period will increase the original adjusted basis. So um, during this 24 month period um, to where the property is substantially rehabbed, uh, the rehab expenditures have to exceed the greater of the adjusted basis of the building. So, um, and it's structural components of $5,000. The basis of the land is not taken into consideration. So they're only, looking i guess that kind of answers your question your initial question about um fair market value or uh, fair value of the property they're not taking into account uh the 20 uh, or the uh the land value they're taking into account the building value and the increase to the buildings itself's value um so i to put it simply it, it appears that it, it would be the tax assessor's numbers that they're going off of then. That's the only thing they can go off of. Yeah, so all, all of our tax bills that, that we get every year has a land value and mm -hmm. then, a, then the building value separate on that. That's right. Mm -hmm. And just let me throw my accounting hat on here because the terms that you're, you're, you're interchanging two terms that don't mean the same thing. Uh-oh. Um, value and basis, two different things. A basis is what they paid for the property. So if they're looking at adjusted basis, that's what they paid for the property plus improvements that they've made, the actual cost of the improvements, not the fair market value. Oh, okay. I see. So yeah, I was using, using the, those yeah. terms, um, that's saying basis. So that's whatever they paid for the property. For the entire property, Carl? Or well, it says taking out the land. Yeah, so okay. so whatever they paid, so whatever they paid for the entire thing, you would have to allocate some to the land and some to the building, and whatever is allocated to the building would be the cost basis. Which you could do with your tax state. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, if the rehab is completed in phases, the same rules will apply, except that instead of a 24 month period, there's a 60 month period um, that's substituted. And the phasing rule is available only if the taxpayer meets three conditions. Um, there is a written set of architectural plans and specs for all phases of the rehab. The written plans must be completed before the physical work on the rehab begins, and it can be reasonably expected that all phases of the rehab will be completed. And third, the property must be placed in service. Um, so the rehab credit is generally allowed in the taxable year. The rehab property is placed into service, uh, provided that the building has met the qualified rehab rehabilitated building requirements for the 24 month period ending in that taxable year. Uh, a qualified rehab building is defined as that which has been substantially rehabbed and was placed in service as a building before the beginning of the rehab as opposed to a ship, airplane, bridge, etc. 
Go ahead. Now, the yeah, credit, I want to make sure that I understand that word, credit. Is, Carl, is, is this a reduction in income taxes or property taxes or what? It, exactly what is this particular credit? You think? That's a good question. It's, um, well, it, the tax credits uh, against the credit against what, Ron? You can uh, you can go back to the. It, it was just on the. Uh, was it on a prior slide? I just missed yeah. it. Yeah, uh, keep going. I'll tell you when to stop. All right. Oh, cool. Other way. Other way. One more. The one with the picture berries. So, for historic tax credits uh, from the federal level, that's uh, that's going to be taken off of your um, your tax liability. Okay. So it's yeah, a that's federal. Your tax liability. So it's an income tax credit. So it is a it is credit against taxes owed. Yeah. So it's an income tax owed, credit. Yes. So, and I'm assuming with the flow through entity, it would flow through to the owners. So if it's like an S corporation, since they don't pay tax, you, typically those credits flow through to the owners. So you take it on if you owned an S corp and you got this tax, you mm -hmm. would take it on your personal tax return. Okay. And and that is taken in one year, correct? It's a one year shot to get the twenty percent. Yep. You can keep going. Some of them will allow carryover, but I don't know about this one. Yeah, this is one. This is one. Oh, okay, I just saw a 1936 uh, date in there. What was that? Back oh, up uh, just a little bit. Here. You can back up one. The 1936 date was uh, one more. I'm sorry. Uh, no, keep going. <laughs> keep going back. There you go. Right there. Yeah, so that's for the non-contributing properties. That's. Uh, for if you're if the property was built before 1936 but it's not a contributing property in the district then um, they can still claim a tax credit it'll be 10 percent though it wouldn't be the 20 percent okay when that comes to the south side of the track mm -hmm. that will come into play it probably. will yes yeah. mm -hmm. Um, it would, uh, because there's so many buildings that are non-contributing over there, um, some have like stuccoed fronts um, and, ha and other changes to it, uh, in which we don't even 100% know which ones will be considered non-contributing by the state and federal government yet. We have a survey of, uh, of our historic resources that indicates some of them are non-contributing. Uh, however, we've had some issues with that survey in the past, so I'm not 100% sure if that's um, here to stay or not. But I would, we're going to be getting an official opinion anyway from the state um, by the end of the year. All right, sorry, Janet. You can, you, finish, Rupert. Thank you. This is it. Yeah. My, my personal recollection is the only, uh, the only buildings downtown from South Carroll down to. Uh, What's the last street going down by Jones Wind? What's that street? Anyway, there, there's, there's only two buildings that have been dramatically physically altered. Now, some of them have been covered up with stucco and with rock, but only the, the building where Chat and Chew is. Mm -hmm. No, the building where the hospice is has also been radically altered and then down there where Tim McCreary's office is that used to be the bank building which right. has been altered I think the rest of them other other than stucco and crazy that that's that's it yeah a lot of them and the criteria that they're using is uh, any changes to the exterior from um, at least 50 years ago so um, which is what's going to designate or indicate if something can even be designated as historic or not so um, for example stucco uh, windows and doors uh, you know facades roofing even in some cases flashing all those things add up to depending on the number of changes or how significant those changes have been uh, that can easily add up to a property being a non-contributing uh, property to a district. So the more non-contributing properties that you have, 
Uh, in my experiences, at least, it, the, the lower your chances are to actually getting on a register at all. Um, so they don't want to designate a whole bunch of properties, 10, 10 properties, and nine of them are non-contributing properties. So um, it's, it's going to be a definitely uphill battle for the south side of the district, but the north side, um, as you could tell, most of it has stayed intact. So um, you guys didn't have that issue back in 2002 on this side. Didn't you tell me that, that it can be done building by building rather than block by block, though? It definitely can, um, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, besides the fact that it would run at an absolute snail's pace to get all of the buildings um, to be designated, um, that just the sheer time to do that could take years, um, especially with so many small properties over there. Um, however, the goal really should be, and especially for any grants that would come down the line, just thinking strategically, uh, it, having one unified and uniform district that you can refer to instead of sc a scattered amount of properties that were designated uh, can help you tremendously on any grant application uh, when it comes to anything historic or improvements on anything that are that is historic so um, if you can draw a common history between buildings and uh, a common location a common place common people all of that strengthens a district. Um, so when it comes to specific grant applications or nominations or what have you, it, it's much easier to apply if all of them um, are designated versus just if we're going one by one, piece by piece, all the way down the street. It, it, it's not efficient. It's not effective. Well, it's been 18 years since we did this over here. You're right, and if they, let's say, um, and I'm just gaming this out for a moment, if, if they come back and say that the South, um, his, South Side Historic District has been too compromised and that um, it can't be a singular district, it's, it's too many non-contributing non properties, um, and the overall sense of place has changed, uh, we can definitely turn to that and we can uh, go building by building by the ones that are non that are not considered non-contributing properties yes we can do that um, we can still go forward with a local historic district as well which will accomplish our goals anyway um, but it wouldn't open uh, the property up to any uh, state or national tax credits federal tax credits uh, for historic <coughs> properties if it's only on a local designation or, or local uh, a, a local uh, grouping of properties. Um, if it's if it doesn't have the state or the federal uh, historic, if it's not on the historic registries, then it's you're going to miss out on all of those tax uh, credit programs. You can't apply them. So that's why it's really important that we get that south side well, on the state or national. Probably the oldest building in town is Jerry Doyle's store. Yes. Mm -hmm. It, that's that's one it, to be it designated. It was a buggy shop back in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. That's one that's supposed to be designated. We have old pictures of it. Um, that's uh, one of my uh, Historic Preservation Commission members was able to find. So uh, where that's actually going to be a part of that district. That's the only building on West Wilson Street that's proposed to be a part of that district. Um, and what is the year cutoff again? 1936 is a cutoff year for this? Um, no, um, for, for designation, you're saying? Yeah. For designation, it's 50, the property has to be at least 50 years old. Well, several on the back street are over 50. Yes, some of them are, but they've been so he heavily altered or there's no historic, uh, photos, there's no historic, uh, uh documentation. Um, there's nothing that, just because something is old, that it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's historic either. Um, there has to be something that's unique. It's not um, like me. You can just look at me, right? <laughs> well, I won't comment on that, but <laughs> um, but I guess that's really a way to kind of curb some of the applications that I'm sure the federal government gets a million applications, and some of, and half of them are probably not even and have any historical nature to them. So, okay, can can I get a handout of? All of this stuff from you. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I'll send it to your uh, email. I'll, I'll actually send it to all of you, your emails. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to the 10% um, federal uh, historic tax credit. 
Um, so if a building is not lo listed in the National Register, which is, uh, this is actually just what Bill uh, was just referring to, um, is not located in a registered historic district, um, but it has been determined to be a non-contributing property uh, by the Department of the Interior, then a 10% re rehab tax credit may be utilized provided that the building was placed in service before 1936, is used for non-residential rental purposes, has not been physically moved after 1936, and meets the following internal and external wall retention. So 50% or more of the existing um, external walls are retained in place as external walls. 75% or more of the existing external walls are retained in place as internal or exter external walls, or 75% or more of the existing internal structure framework is retained in place. So you can't just knock it down and build it back, basically. Um, uh, and I, I, I can't refer to any specific property um, but we have this situation now um, in town, and so um, I don't know what I can and can't say. Um, but what what I will say is we have the situation now. Um, we have a building that's practically collapsing on itself, and um, the it was built before 1936, but it was moved in town. The, the building was moved to the south side of the um, tracks from way up near Fullerville and uh, it wouldn't qualify for anything else other than these 10%, um, ta this 10% tax credit uh, because it's not contributing to the block that's surrounding it. Even if the south side historic district was designated, it still wouldn't be contributing to it. And uh, it was built obviously before 1936 and it was moved so the 10 percent tax credit is something that the owner can take if they would be willing to do a rehab project there if that's the building i'm thinking about it's at least 100 years older than 1936. Yeah. <laughs> right all right so the, this is the eligible eligibility map again um, for the federal tax credits is the same as the state because this district is on the state and federal uh, register of historic places. Rural zone. So with the rural zone program, um, and I, I apologize, I actually misspoke earlier in the beginning of the presentation when I said that rural zone can't, can't be combined with state uh, historic tax credits. I apologize, I should have been federal. Um, uh, federal and rural zone can can go together, but the state one it can't go with. That's what I should have said. So um, state and rural zone you can't double up on them. Georgia basically says you have to pick one or the other, um, and you, you it's up to each individual business. It's up to each individual uh, property owner on which one is more beneficial to them: state historic tax credits or rural zone program. Um, and that's going to be different for everyone based on their uh, their level of investment, really. So, and and we'll see that through here. You can see on the bottom here so, uh, the three different tax credits that fall under the rural zone program. So there's the job tax credit, which offers two thousand dollars for a uh, new full time equivalent job created. Um, there has to be a minimum of two jobs created for that in order to claim the credit. Um, this lasts for five years. It started back in 2020, by the way, um, in the beginning, January 1st, and it's going to go all the way to December 31st, 2024. Uh, the investment credit um, is equivalent to 25% of the purchase price of the building, and the rehab credit, which is equivalent to 30% of the qualified rehab costs. Uh, the, both of those two on the uh, bottom can be layered together. I believe all of them can be layered together, right? Yeah, all of them can be layered together. Um, so if, for example, I'm a, uh, someone who's interested in investing downtown Villarica, I come into town, I purchase a building, uh, the, and I'm going to claim the investment uh, tax credit. Then I want to rehab the building. I can claim the rehab tax credit as well. Um, I'm rehabbing it for a reason, for a, uh, for a store to move in on the bottom floor. Let's say I have apartments above or what have you. Um, the, as long as that store, that store is going to be creating jobs. So that's the job tax credit. So the job tax credit can also be claimed by the business that's going to be moving in as well. So, um, but there has to be a job in, in all of these for the rural zone program. There has to be some type of a job creation aspect to it. And that minimum is two. 
uh, full-time equivalent job. So if I have four part-timers, that would add up to two uh, full-time positions, for example. And you have to maintain that for five years. If you don't, they're not going to take the credit back from you from the previous year, but moving forward, you will not receive the credit. And if the credit is more than what your liability is off of your uh, taxes, then you can't, it's not cash back in your pocket or anything like that. It just goes away from there. You've utilized all of it. Okay, in a real world example. Sure. Right? Here, 25% of the purchase price of the building. Uh -huh. Now that is building plus the property right there, correct? It's what did Bill, you can pay? you take it talk into the mic? Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. We can't hear I'm, you. I'm, I'm not accustomed to this. <laughs> if if somebody pays, say, $100,000 for a piece of property with an old building on it, mm -hmm. so the first year, the first year, he can take a 25% on it? It's going to be carried through the entirety of the five years. Um, it's okay. not a one-shot um, the first year. Okay. so They space it out. So it's prorated over five years that's correct yes okay mm -hmm. so when the rehab is completed does the five years start all over again because you you may buy something and not start to rehab it until you know 18 months two years down the road and then it may take another two years to get it rehabbed well, as long as you purchase the building after January 1st of 2020, then um, you can apply those tax credits to even uh, future income tax liability as well. If, the, if you don't take, for example, if you're uh, if you're going to owe if you know you're going to owe taxes in the next year or two years or three years down the line, and you're in the middle of a rehab project, you can continue and to take this credit and apply it you just have to go through janet's office and you can continue to apply it going forward as well as long as you're you're going to get it for the entirety of the five years so the rule zone application is done through my office but the department of community affairs is actually the ones that approve it mm -hmm. but is that five years it, it is it a rolling five years like um, yes, Five yeah. years start at yes and no. Yes and no. Um, it's, I know, I, nothing I, is simple. I love answers like the, that. <laughs> it's, yes, it is rolling in a sense because if you come, if you come in after, uh, let's say you come in in 2023, for example, um, there's only about two years left on the program. Um, they're going to continue it to uh, two additional years uh, beyond just the 2024 date for people who are coming in late for it. You're not just X'd out of it because you didn't come in in 2020 or 2021. You're still going to be capable of, uh, of applying for that credit and, and getting it and having it for even two years beyond when the municipality is uh, designated as a rural zone. So this... That's, this... The main, that's going to be the cutoff, yeah. though. This law has a, an expiration date to it, basically. Correct. But it can possibly be extended, like all laws can possibly be extended. Like, like well, Ron said, if you started in 2023 and you just started the rehab then, they'll give you a few more years because they understand that you're coming in on the tail end of it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a difference between um, the law being expanded or extended and the uh, designation itself. No communities so far, I believe there's like 23 or so that have been designated, and none of these uh, communities have, uh, even the first ones that have been uh, admitted to this program, none of them have had an extension. So I think this is really a one and done. And on top of that, we wouldn't be eligible for an extension anyway because our population is now over the threshold. You had to be 15,000 and under to even be qualified. So we were right at 15. And we, I think we were like 20 people short of being at 15,000 when we applied for it. So we are still in the game up until 2024? Correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because our population goes over 15,000 is not going to kick us out of the program or anything. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, okay, so like I said, it's dependent on the creation of at least two new full-time equivalent jobs. Uh, it can't be um, combined with federal historic tax credits, uh, but it can be, that's very odd. 
that should be reversed. That's not correct. Um, it actually, I apologize. I had them reversed again. Uh, the two, these two historic tax credits, uh, have me confused half the time. So, uh, it actually should read that the federal historic tax credit can be taken. It's the state historic tax credit that cannot be taken with rural zone state because they're two state programs. Just think of it that way. Um, and you can't layer them both together. It should, and I'll correct that. Uh, but it, it is, you can use it with federal historic tax credits. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about the criteria of um, what we had to go through to get the rural zone program. So we um, we had to have a population less than 15,000, um, a core downtown area with structures older than 50 years. We have that evidence of blight or disinvestment in the downtown area. We had that implementation of a strategic plan in the downtown area. We had that with the RSVP plan that was commissioned, I believe, in 2018, 17? 16. 16. Ooh. Oh boy. All right. And a completed market analysis, which indicates gaps with the local business makeup, which we also had that uh, as well. We, we also uh, were able to commission that. Go ahead. When did All we right. do that, Janet? When did we do what? The, the RSVP? Last one up here. Oh, uh, what was the last one? The rural zone itself? No, which indicate gaps in the local business makeup late 2019 it was completed okay mm -hmm. Thanks. all right so this is the rural zone map um and so as you could see it in, it includes our main historical buildings on both sides of the rail but also it extends down to the donridge ford block as well um, that was kind of a uh, testy thing for us uh, because we thought they were just going to throw that part out because it's kind of far away from the center of the downtown and it's not as many historic structures on that block as you can imagine. Uh, but they gave it to us. Uh, they uh, really cautioned us and were very clear in their original presentation about rural zone uh, where we, when we inquired that they do not want large expanses of areas that are not in, in the core historic area and uh, we of course tr went ahead got with lucky. it anyway <laughs> and we got lucky so uh, they being, typically only give maybe half of that and so we got quite a bit but that lucky. that block is important for and, and I think it's worth the time to spend on it because uh, obviously there's large parcels of land or at least much larger than we have downtown and they can all be consolidated into one large project if that's something that uh, presents itself at some point in the future. Uh, so that inclusion of that would be huge uh, and someone can easily reap the benefits of the rural zone program on a, a section of town like that. Okay, so outside of rural zone, there's other job tax credit programs. And um, again, like I said, when it comes to these job tax programs and um, basically almost all of the uh, programs that you're going to see after this um, that are tax credits, uh, how they work with rural zone is the email that I have out um, that I'm waiting for a response on uh, from the state. So um, you could see here for the job tax credit, it, it excludes retail jobs. So that's something that's different than rural zone automatically. Rural zone al uh, allows for the creation of retail jobs in order to claim the credit. The job tax credit program does not. A uh, $3,000 uh, job tax credit per year for five years for Carroll and Douglas counties. The uh, entire state is split up into various different tiers. Uh, we're in the second to highest tier for the amount of job tax credit that can be uh, given per year. And uh, there's a minimum of 10 jobs that would need to be created. 100% of tax liability can go towards. Which tax is that? Which, which tax is that? Um, that would be, oh God, um, I get this one mixed up with the other tax credit. Um, um, I don't, I, it's definitely either it's definitely either your the income tax or it's going to be the uh, I'm blanking now. Um, I believe it is income tax, but there's a, a it may be payroll tax too. I'm thinking too. It, it's one or the other. It, it's another program in here. 
that does uh, income tax and one does uh, payroll tax. But I I'm like 90% sure it would be income tax for this one as well. Mm -hmm. This is the other job tax credit. Quality job tax credit. Um, companies that create at least 50 new jobs in a 12-month period and pay wages that are at least 110% of the county average are eligible to receive a tax credit for up to $5,000 per year uh, for up to five years, uh, and that's per job per year. New quality jobs created within seven years can qualify for the credit. Credits may be used to offset the company's state payroll. Yes, this is payroll withholding once all other tax liability has been exhausted and may be carried forward for 10 years. New jobs that do not meet the requirements for the quality uh, jobs tax credit can still uh, apply for the jobs tax credit, which is the one on the previous screen. Um, and you could see in the chart there uh, the, credit, uh, the credit value per new quality job based on the um, average wage um, as a percentage of the county average. There's also an R&D tax credit. So it's for all R&D expenditures, technology, and the, and the like, um, or the improvement of a product that can qualify for a dollar-for-dollar -dollar reduction um, in federal and state income taxes owed. Uh, the Georgia R&D credit can be used to offset up to 50% of a company's Georgia income tax liability. Um, and any excess R&D credit can be applied to the company's pay state payroll withholding as well. So I believe the initial one, may it's probably the same thing. There's a trend that's happening here. Uh, that once you exhaust one, you could, it goes towards payroll withholdings. Um, companies may claim a 10% tax credit of increased R&D expenses subject to a base amount calculation, and then that calculation is the um, last there that's below. Um, new Georgia companies or companies with no prior R&D experience or, or expenditures rather in Georgia, uh, the base amount is 30% of the current year's Georgia's gross receipts. And your investment tax credit. Um, the investment tax credit is available to existing manufacturing or telecommunications bu uh, businesses that have operated a facility in Georgia for three years prior to an investment of 50000 or more. This income tax credit ranges between 1% and 8% depending on the county's uh, economic status. Higher credit ranges are available for investment in recycling or pollution control equipment or defense plans, which we don't have one here. Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program. Uh, so as you can see, we're getting into a lot of job tax credits now. So most of these are industrial tax. So yeah, some of them, some of them will be industrial in nature, uh, and some, some are. You know, I think for our purposes and our goals here, um, just for downtown and DDA, a lot of these probably won't come come into play. Um, I just included them just so we can kind of see everything that Georgia in general has available. Uh, so people can kind of make the decision on their own based on their business. Um, but this one is basically for hiring um, within certain target groups um, and pe people who have maybe have had significant barriers to employment in the past. Um, so uh, if certain like TANF or food stamp recipients, uh, residents of an empowerment zone or rural uh, renewal county, uh, which there's uh, very few of them now left in Georgia anyway. And uh, the tax credit is between $1,200 and $9,000 per qualified employee. Affordable housing tax credits. Um, so the state of Georgia is very unique in the sense that it has one single application for all affordable housing tax credit programs, which puts Georgia way up ahead of many, many states. There's very few that have that. Um, so it expedites their, uh, their ability to uh, apply and get answers and uh, feedback, which is even more important to me, feedback from um, the federal government and the state government simultaneously. Um, so if someone wants to come in uh, to downtown, um, they want to uh, utilize uh, affordable housing tax credit, uh, um, they, they can go ahead and do that with some of these other programs. Uh, for example, the rural zone program um, does allow for housing tax credits to be uh, used on it as well. I did find that out. No. One more? Okay. So there's uh, additional uh, Georgia tax credits too. Uh, so 
companies that are seeking to realize uh, the full value of new technology investments may get a credit to offset the cost of retraining employees. So they have a retraining program as well. It gives $500 uh, per uh, employee that would need to be retrained and uh, that it would be offset from um, any tax liabilities. And investors in a state licensed child care facility as well or providing or sponsoring child care for employees may be eligible for tax credits uh, for their expenses. And then there's a, even more tax credits. There's hiring uh, for hiring individuals granted parole within 12 months of his or her date of hire, uh, creating jobs by insurance companies liable for the premium tax and creating more than 1800 jobs over a six to eight year period, depending on the amount of the investment. And we all know, of course, about the film, movie, and entertainment investments in the state and the tax credits that, are, uh, that they have. And there's no cap on those tax credits. So that's uh, kind of all I, I kind of had for today. But um, I, I mean, as you can probably imagine, uh, there's uh, the ones that are really going to come into play for us are the ones that we already administer now. Um, in addition to rural zone, in addition to state income tax uh, or state uh, historic tax credits and federal um, state tax credits. Uh, some of these job tax credits and the like aren't location specific. Uh, they, they're able to be taken in any of their eligible counties. Um, so it's not something that's necessarily unique to us, like, for example, the uh, rural zone program, uh, where there's only 23 uh, municipalities in the state that has that. So um, that's a a huge plus for us compared to um, programs that are administered throughout the entire state and for everyone. Well, Ron, this was more, more than I ever envisioned. <laughs> I tell you, I, you know, I, I learned so much too, but I, the questions about as, you know, as far as what, you know, what uh, you, we can utilize together is still important. So I'm looking forward to getting a response back from the state and see exactly how many of these other programs can be used because some of them are, do fly right in the face. All of these job tax credits, for example, fly right in the face of rural zone and their job tax credits. So um, I, I sense that they're probably going to say we can't, that we can't use them with any sort of state program. They've already kind of hinted at that with the, um, with historic tax credits, so I can only imagine any other state relief they can't utilize, but I'll wait until I get that email back. Okay, thank you any very questions? much. No? Okay. I've got a question. What does that fall under, old business or new business? <laughs> <laughs> that would be new business. All right. <laughs> So that would be historic business, wouldn't it? <laughs> move, moving on down to number one, discussion of benefits of remodeling downtown buildings. I believe that's bills. I think that's just what we went over, right? Okay. All right. And the historic, we've already been over that then, right? All right. Yep. Consideration of a license agreement with Norfolk Southern and authorization of execution by the chairman. So in last week's, I guess it was last week, city council meeting, the city council approved uh, an additional agreement with Norfolk Southern so that we may uh, be allowed to put the gateway sign on their property for an additional $1,080. We, we will be allowed to put uh, the gateway sign on their property. So that was signed off by the mayor. I think I forwarded you guys the agreement. Nothing is free. This is per year, I assume. Huh? Correct. Wow. Were we not already leasing that property since we had the sidewalk there? Correct. <laughs> That's in addition to what we're already paying. So they are subleasing part of the property we're already leasing. Correct. Okay. So if you guys don't have any questions about that, um, I will, uh, once you guys make a motion or make a comment or approve, we'll move forward with sending this to North Folk, we still have a couple, two more agreements that we need to secure to get the gateway signs put up. Is that the only location that we can put that? I mean, 
That's recent. the location that the DDA approved. When did you guys approve the gateway signs? And it's taken three years to get the signature. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it is the logical place to put. Yeah, the it is. It's the three-way stop. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's logical, but is it the value there? But that's all I was getting at. So, so we need a motion for that then. Do we need a motion, Tracy? Even though the city council approved it, I spoke to um, Stacy Blackman, the um, DDA attorney, and she said that we would need a motion for the DDA to authorize you to execute on behalf of the DDA. Okay, do we have a motion to approve this agreement? So moved. I already voted on it once. I'll just <laughs> do it again. Well, we got a motion. Got a second. I'll second. Motion to second. All in favor? Thank you. All right, moving on to number six, public comment. Item for future agenda. Executive session. Do I have a motion to adjourn the DDA meeting? So moved. All right, second. we got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Okay, we need to amend the agenda for the Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, for a request for a Frontier Rodeo or, uh, sponsorship. Do we need to call the meeting to order first? All right, we need to call the meeting to order first <laughs> then. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Do I have a motion to call this meeting to order? If so, uh, has everybody taken a minute to look over the minutes from our last meeting? If so, do I hear a motion? Make a motion to approve. Got a motion to approve. Have a second. I'll second. All in favor? Mm. Now we need to amend the agenda, right? Yes. Okay. For a request from Frontier Rodeo for a sponsorship of $500 under old business. Or new business. New what? business. Would that be new business? Under new business then. Yes. But we need to do it before. Go ahead, Tracy. So, um, speaking with Stacy Blattman, again, the uh, DDA attorney, um, since what we're going to be discussing is possibly separating the DDA from the CBB, she didn't want that to occur um, unless after that having business that we have to conduct on expenditure because once you do that then you're no longer going to act as CBB board so she suggested taking that item and putting it before those actions um, to consider separation in case you all do vote to go that direction so how about that other one so I'll make a motion to amend the agenda to add the frontier rodeo and new business and move new business ahead of old business second all right okay all in favor so now we'll go to financial reports. No, oh, I should have made a motion to move that too. <laughs> um, did everybody, I didn't, I got to hand it out. I emailed it out, but y'all probably didn't get it. Everybody didn't get it. So here's the report for last month. Everybody just needs one page. It's front and back. Did I give you enough? I think so. All right. I'll put one up here for Tracy. On the front of it, you'll see just the um, same as last month, looking at the uh, tax collections that we've had from the city and the expenses that we've had. Um, that's for January through July. And then on the back, I've looked at the tax collections over the past five, four years, uh, 17, 18, 19, and 20 comparing the months so that we can see the impact that COVID's had. And you know, last month, uh, the May collections really dropped there to uh, like under $6,000 where it was almost 13,000 the year before. Uh, but June, which is actually the May taxes that we collect in June, actually had a little bit of a rebound. It's still less than what it's been in the prior years, um, but it came up quite a bit. So I don't know if we had a lot more people staying in hotels in May than we did in April. I guess they got over the COVID scare a little bit. I don't know, maybe Sharon knows why that. Do you know why the hotel occupancy went up? 
Oh. Do you know why your hotel occupancy would have gone up in, in May over April? The things just starting to pick back up? Oh, you got to step up to the mic. Sorry. Didn't mean to call you out. <laughs> um, so I think that it's picking up just because of people are starting to kind of get over COVID a little bit. They're picking up their weddings again. They're picking up their vacations that they had to postpone for the longest time. And we're just seeing that kind of spill over. Um, but right now, people are putting a hold on it again because of the increased cases. So we're going to see that dwindling once more, okay. which we're already starting to see. Yeah. And just for the record, could you just state your name and who you're with so we can get it for the minutes? Yeah, my name is Olivia Bush. I'm with the Holiday Inn Express. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, and as you'll see, you know, we've reduced all our expenses because we knew the income was going to be down. Um, so we're actually in, in a pretty good spot right now um, with the reduction in expenses. But Sharon is starting to do a little more traveling. Now the um, information centers are opening back up. We're starting to do a little more promotion than we were. So and picking up a little bit more expenses, but we're still um, under budget, under the revised budget for now. Any questions from Carl? Okay. Moving on down to new business now. Request from Frontier Rodeo for a sponsorship for $500. Do you want to, is there Somebody say anything about it or do we see make a motion? Any comment? No, I know we hadn't given out any sponsorship all year, have we? I think Sharon had a comment on this. Our biggest, my only comment is that we have not been giving away any money because we've been trying to hold on to what we have because um, we knew that we would be hit with the tax, you know, lowering hotel motel taxes. So we haven't been issuing any sponsorship. We have um, normally would sponsor the Golden City Cruises and we've already told them that we won't be able to sponsor them this year in October and I don't think it would be fair to give money because we literally I, I took it out of the budget I took all sponsorship out of the budget um, and and reduced our advertising so we really mm -hmm. don't have anything set aside for sponsorship anyway yeah and if you'll look at the going back to the financial statement I just gave out you'll see that this time last year we had given out about thirteen thousand dollars in sponsorships and grants this year we haven't given away any sponsorship money uh, the only grant that was for the uh, uh, meal that we did for first responders to recognize first responders um, so we haven't given any sponsorship money this year so do we have a motion this is one of the few things that actually pulls in a tourist I think the Golden City Cruisers all drive here on Saturday morning and go home Saturday night. But some of these people actually spend the night around here, or maybe two nights even. And so that was the only reason that we really voted for the uh, sponsorship last year, was it, it was a viable tourist thing. Uh, uh, right, but it's, uh, if you look, I put uh, the mechanics of um, restricted spending for tourism spending so that you get an idea one of the reasons why we have to kind of start looking at what we're spending money for sponsorship on because it's not really falling under using the, the tourism tax dollars for so we have to really start looking at that and considering what we're um, actually putting sponsorship money into as well yeah, I looked at that, Sharon, and, and we have got carnivals, arenas, amusement parks, uh, pretty wide-ranging definition of things here on the first page that, uh, that, that are eligible. Mm -hmm. Information centers, hunting preserves. Uh, I didn't realize 
it was that extensive until I looked at your. Yeah, seat I'm. Here. St I'm. St when I became the tour tourism coordinator, even I focused more on sales because that's what I was supposed to have been doing. But I'm literally like just kind of handling all the tourism aspect of the CVB. So I'm studying more the complete running of a CVB so that we're in compliance in all areas. And that was one of the things that I'm trying to make sure that we stay in compliance with the state and everything. Because if someone made a complaint uh, to DCA, it could really start to trickle down. and affect the city as a whole, as a matter of fact, since they're the ones collecting the taxes. Well, there's a lot of non-restricted uses here, isn't there? Proceeds can be used for any legal general fund purpose in the city, county, or consolidated government. which I wasn't aware of either. But isn't it that the motel hotel tax, 60% of it goes into the general fund, so to speak, and 40% must go to tourism? Isn't that it's for tourism. generally the way it works? It's for, it's for tourism marketing and promoting this city as a whole, as opposed to an event. So this would be like advertising, well, an, an event, whatever and they're using it for, I guess, advertising them. I don't. Well, haven't we done that for concerts? As a whole, because that's a city event. If you think about it, that's a city event. On, mm -hmm. And the mill falls under tourism product development because mm -hmm. it's okay. like, you know, an arena, so to speak. Well, this is Don Rich Rodeo anyway, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure Richard Smith to put in that 500 bucks. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm sure so he sure can manage it. it. So in your opinion, it would not qualify because it's a private event? Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. Do I hear a motion then? I don't know. If it doesn't qualify, I don't think we can. All right, got a motion to deny. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? All in favor of denying it? Denying it, yeah. That's plain. Might as well stay up here. Did you get the other boat up here? Got Ellen. Okay, yes, all right. She voted Yes or no? Well, oh. okay. There you go. All right, now we'll move on down to old business. Update on your room. You're still up there. <laughs> I thought I might as well stay up here. Um, I just, I'll go as quickly. Um, I got us a free listing on the group travel leader website. So um, I've just been trying to research ways to keep us out there without having to spend a lot of money. And um, they threw out an offer. And um, so I passed it on to our hotels. I also passed it on to the museum. But it's a free listing. It's a really, you can send a nice picture in and, you know, contact and everything. So that'll work for us. Um, I also sent all out to all of you, um, I don't know if you saw the email, but the um, governor's conference, which is usually the first week of September, has been was canceled back in April. And they um, initially were gonna do a one day tourism summit. However, with the surge in the virus, they have now moved that to completely um, virtual. So I sent it to you all if you're interested in um, signing up and um, taking part. The governor will be speaking, it's an all day kind of I think it ends at 3.30. Um, but I sent it to all of you in case you wanted to take part. You know, because normally I know you wouldn't be to the governor's conference, but if you're interested, um, I sent that to you. And um, I've been doing a Facebook weekly 
business feature just to kind of get people downtown, get tourists to really understand that our downtown is open. So I feature a business every week. I started that, I think it's two weeks ago. And um, we're renewing the billboard, the digital billboard that we have on 61, the business district. Um, they're going to keep it, our rate at $400 for period. So might as well keep it and we're going to do it for a year. It's, it's been a good uh, thing for us. It's, it's helped us to um, just keep the downtown, keep the city in general. Um, it's tourists coming in. So that's what I got for y'all. And I have um, tonight, um, Olivia, you already met from the Holiday Inn. Melissa Garrett, you all know Melissa, uh, with on court, and Debbie Hornstein with Georgia Real Life. Oh, Real, living Georgia. Real Living Georgia Life <laughs> Realty. <laughs> but there are some of the, um, there are three that I have asked um, if they were interested in being a part of the CVBF. We move forward with separating, and they were very much interested in that. Okay, consideration of CVB bylaws amendments. That's yours. Before yeah. you leave, just a general update, Sharon. What is the present situation with the tourism office? Has it moved at all in the last few months? I, I don't mean physically relocated. I mean over at Butterballs. No, there's not been any work um, on Butterballs. Um, they they did some grading because they I think Tom sold the asphalt. Somebody wanted the asphalt. And they were going to take it for free. <laughs> so that, that got cleaned up. Um, and um, they did a little grading, you know, around the back, cut down some trees and stuff. But as far as moving in, um, no. No work yet. No, you're talking about going in no, butter balls. Butter balls no, I am just talking about any movement at all on, on, a, on a no, we're gonna new location. Be, we're going to be in there for a minute where we are. I expect so. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I, I gave Melissa my agenda, so y'all have to keep me on point. Um, well, Consideration of CBB bylaw yes. amendments. Yes. So, so <laughs> thinking that you all may want to amend the uh, bylaws for the CBB, I've sent you some examples. I uh, hope you all had a chance to look over that and uh, look over some of them and see, you know, maybe what concept you wanted to follow or whatever and make any adjustments or anything like that. I took a look at the ones you sent over, Sharon, and the ones, um, so you sent over Douglasville and Milledgeville. Mm -hmm. And Columbus, I think. Oh, I didn't see the Columbus one. Okay, well, of the two I saw, I'm sorry. Um, Milledgeville, was very detailed in their yeah, bylaws. That's what I thought too. Yeah. Um, however, it appears that Douglasville passed, I guess the council passed an ordinance creating it, the CVB, because you can find that those Douglasville bylaws, they don't really appear to be bylaws, they just seem to be like, yeah, they're just creating not this real board. Bylaws, right, yeah. and I found it on Unicode, that it was within the, the code of ordinances for the city of Douglasville. I didn't find anything like that for Milledgeville and their code of ordinances. So um, I liked the way Douglasville organized or comprised their board um, with having the city. I would just, for example, like this. The city of Douglasville has Samantha Rosado, and I looked her up, and she is mm -hmm. your equivalent mm -hmm. in the city of Douglasville. I think the only thing is, I do like the fact that it's all mayor and council appointed persons. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to see maybe, in addition to basically your your position on there, I would like to see something like, for example, Douglasville has three at-large spots. One of those is. Um, a gentleman by the name of Travis Landrum in the city parks and rec. I would like to see if recreation tourism is going to be a focus, then I would like to see a designated spot for that. We, I, I, I've covered that. Um, Courtney has agreed that he would like to be on the board as a representative right. for 
Villarica Park for, from Villarica Parks and Recreation. Right. What I'm saying though is like instead of just having that as an at-large position, have a designee from the Parks and Rec Department position kind of thing. And I don't know have and then I would just I'm not sure having the chambers involved in our position. Yeah, if I it's, don't think we need because I don't think we need the chamber involved in our position. I mean, I thought, ideally, I, I that too. ideally I wouldn't mind having them involved, but maybe they could be at large folks if they're interested. I just don't know. I feel That's like cool. it's just. I I personally would like to maybe see a little bit more. Um, like another thing is, for example, like they have the Cultural Arts Council here. We don't have any lo anything like that, but the most comparable thing would be perhaps somebody from Pine Mountain Gold Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe that's too narrow. Maybe you want somebody from the, quote, museum industry, and if we ever do get some other museum or attraction besides Pine Mountain Gold Museum, you know, maybe in the beginning it's somebody from over there, but maybe in a few years down the road it could be somebody else. I thought um, from, from the beginning we would... That's the only attraction we have. Right. So um, it made sense to me to have somebody from Parks and Recreation. Right. Somebody from um, the museum, um, yeah. which I thought Wesley, because um, he's he he really gets the you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, and then a couple of our hotels, um, a restaurant, and then a business owner, which is where Melissa and Debbie would come in. Right. Yeah, and, I, and so I guess my thing is, if we're going to put this and we're creating in these designee spots, I mean, my thing is, I don't know if I would, you know, for, I don't know if I would, I don't know how tight we need to make these, or can we make them a little bit more ambiguous so there's more flexibility in the future? Like, so for example, even like on the, if we're going to do a rec tourism designee, well, does that person have to be? A city employee, or could it be if somebody opens up an equivalent to a Lake Point or something, and then they could be on there? I mean, you know, right now it probably would be somewhere from Parks and Rec, but 10 years in the future. But if you looked at Milledgeville, how many times they amended? I noticed that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can always be amended. Right. So. Um, and I kind of like the way Milledgeville says, you know, three elected by the board on not that part, but who are associated with and represent the hotel, motel, or restaurant and hospitality industry. So basically, instead of saying we got to have one from the hotel, one from the restaurant, one from the, just put them all together. Right, and I think that allows the flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets but, the right people on there and allows right. flexibility to. But my only concern is, what if you know, a few years down the road you have all restaurateurs on there and all of a sudden the hotels are cut out in the future? I, I, think, I feel like there has to be some kind of boundary, like there mm -hmm. needs to be some this is our intent, and but you know you have flexibility to waiver from this if the if there's if necessary. So, like ideally, I would like to say, okay, well we're going to have two hotel members on there. But then if all of a sudden the folks from hotels, I mean they are interested now, but maybe they're not interested in five years. I would like the flexibility then to put a tourism person on there or a I don't know if we ever get a movie theater, you know, or something. I don't know, but change it up, but mm -hmm. kind of, you know, be able to put our, what we would like to see, but at least give some flexibility. That's the only thing. So I don't know, if, are you still working with um, uh, legal counsel on creating this? Or are you looking for direction from us tonight? Or I'm looking for direction from you all so I can go to legal counsel and talk. And get <laughs> so them to. what you want me to do. Okay. What you would like to see and then I can relay that. Okay. But Tom's sitting here, so he heard everything. So. Alright. And he remembers things way better than I. So he'll tell Macklin, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'll say, I'll say this. Um, I like the idea that the advisor, the members be appointed by mayor and council. I mean, if they're going to be basically spending hotel motel tax that the city is collecting, then I think the city needs to have some sort of ability to govern the board or have a final say at the board. I don't final want to say be, who's on the board. Uh, who's on the board, right. Because if they start going awry, I think the city needs to be able to reel them in through appointments and so forth. So I do like that idea. I think the majority 
have been. Yeah, it wasn't opponent. totally clear from on the millage to me. Field. Maybe I overlooked it. I, I believe that's what I saw. Um, but I, and Columbus also was, um, if I remember correctly, was um, appointed by the council. I think from okay. staff recommendations or whatever. Yeah, it just says shall be seven voting directors and three non-voting ex officio directors. Uh, okay, one appointed by the mayor of the city of Milledgeville, one appointed by the chairperson, the Baldwin County Commissioners, and three elected by the board. So I don't think that's mayor and council. That's, yeah. I like the Douglasville model better okay. in that regard. Um, you want to chime in? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I'm, so just, I'm doing all the sometimes. talking up here, so I don't know if anybody has anything else they want to talk about <laughs> regarding this. I but know. yeah, I, I mean, I, I like the diversity idea of having people that are actually impacted by this, but also I like Matt's idea of having the control so it's not lopsided in any kind of way as well. Yeah, I, my only thing is, and I know we've talked about different um, goals for our tourism industry or our Convention and Visitors Bureau. We've talked about recreation tourism, for example. I think this might be a time for us to really sit down and think, okay, and then kind of model the board after that, but leave some flexibility. Like, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to have a recreation person on there if we're not going to pursue that kind of thing. You know, or if we say, hey, you know what, maybe like Covington had and would the film tourism you know, maybe we take an evaluation. I don't know if we have that, uh, enough time to do that. We well, can, we've can already, Wesley and I have already redone our, our film con our film permitting process. Mm -hmm. So that's um, much easier. It's not something we can ease into. But um, with the parks that we have, we can definitely, and we want to, and plan to go after sports tourism. Okay. There's no there's no point in like having all these great parks these and stuff. Right. I mean, it's in the future, but you know, because there's work that needs to be done, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, that's been on, even when Chris Pike was here, that's been on our radar for as long. I, I'll be here, oh God, uh, the 29th of this week, I'll be here four years. <laughs> right. Um, and that's been on our radar since then. So. Um, sports tourism has always been in the plans to try and get something going. And I think um, getting in, we're getting in a new parks and rec direct, I think that's going to help us move okay. into that. Yes, we so actually I, attempted to get something going out on uh, Highway 61 at that facility back around 2000, and we've been trying ever since, and we've failed every, every attempt we made. Now, I, I'm using we as a city, not, you know, we as a board right. here. But it, so far, I have not seen any effort that bore fruit from parks and rec to generate any kind of a tourism thing, although that was the original selling point for that property, was to have uh, baseball uh, series out there and softball playoffs and so forth. So it's, going, it's not it going to happen overnight, worked. but I yeah. think we can grow it for sure. Well, it hadn't happened overnight for sure. Mm -hmm. You are correct. And there are so many com competing facilities around mm -hmm. that there's a big one up in Bartow County. Mm -hmm. That's a lake I, point, yeah. I, lake point. I, I haven't mm -hmm. seen it, but I, ha I have read about it. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice. I don't know how successful it is, but it's, it's, very it's a horse to, co to compete against. Mm -hmm. Bill, yeah, it's wasn't, a, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Bill, wasn't that private back then, back in 2000, 2001? It was privately owned, the VPLEX site. That's it my record. Have, yes. Yeah. Do you happen, do y'all happen to remember what the name of it was? Because I ran across it one day on Google and I cannot find it now. The VPLEX was? Yeah, yes. it was privately owned. Correct. Something with a C. I, I ran across it on Google, like on an image search, hmm. and I can't find it anywhere. It was an old website. Right. Their idea was to have yeah. all of the ball games down there, and and they couldn't make it work. And as a private industry, they 
they couldn't make it work either. I don't know. I can't remember. Janet, use your mic though. Center field might have been it. Tom is insisting. <laughs> well, my takeaway is I would like the city to um, have that mayor and point mayor and council appointment process, and then in the beginning at least, and maybe this could just be amended at a later date. I would like to have a strong city presence on the board through the different areas of tourism that we can um, mayor and council I don't know even a council member on there I don't know but I will just at the beginning until it kind of gets its feet put it that way center field, center field. Center field. that's right it was center field Does it you Tracy? Right, I'm Googling it now y'all want to say anything <laughs> my team back here is like mm -mm, you do look good <laughs> But I, I asked them to come, you know, so that you know that you all would know that they were very much interested in um, in working with the CVB and um, and helping us just move on. Yep, I found it. I, yeah, you I found the, the website. I was talking. It's center, and you go to it's an old 2002 LoopNet.com listing, and LoopNet does a bunch of commercial properties and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it says playoff sports bar and grill, Centerfield Sports Complex. And, and I've talked with Mochi about it um, as well. She's, ex you know, she's she's excited about doing something like that as well. So I mean, I think um, for future we, we we can get some sports. We have to start small. And I did a seminar at the governor's conference last year um, regarding that. Um, I remember coming back and showing Tom the numbers, you know, the revenue that we were missing out on and. Um, I think one of his girls played travel ball, so he said, yeah, I know about that. You know, it, it was painful. It was painful for me to see the numbers, you know, the, the revenue that mm. we were missing out on because not having sports tourism, you know, so. Well, that's really the only thing other than the Goldmine Museum and downtown. Yep, the, that's those are the three. Those are, are the, those are the are three. three. Yep. And what bothers me about this separation, of course, is the, is the downtown not being heavily represented in it. And by heavily, I mean, you know, really heavily. Our, our main tourist att attraction downtown are our restaurants. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to change because mm -hmm. uh, if, if you think about the history of small towns, especially in the south that I, I'm aware of, that it, we have got a railroad track right in the middle of it. And when, when I was thinking about this earlier uh, this week, years ago, now bear with me a minute because I've, I've got a lot of memories. Some of them get all, all messed up. But we had five mom and pop grocery stores downtown. We had four clothing stores downtown. We had a bank downtown. We had uh, car dealerships downtown. We had a cotton gin, we had a feed mill, we had uh, hosiery mills downtown because the hosiery mills had moved into what were at one time businesses, uh, re retail businesses. And then along comes the concept of a big supermarket or a bigger supermarket. Well, all five of the mom and pop grocery stores disappear. Later, we've got Walmart and Home Depot to come in. Our hardware stores disappeared. Now we've got Amazon. And any idea that we're going to fill up downtown with boutiques and fancy little stores, I think, is a folly. It is going to have to be focused on quality restaurants and even offices downtown which would generate traffic downtown which would use the restaurants we're we're not going to have boutiques I, I have dealt with numerous people who wanted to open up a store most of them were young women who had good ideas and were energetic and smart as a whip but they were undercapitalized and didn't know a thing about how to manage a business and so 
they started and were gone within just a few months. And, and, and so getting things, getting businesses to occupy downtown is going to be difficult, very, very difficult. I come from a long line of trying, <laughs> going back 40 years. So downtown has got to focus on a, a lot of, uh, Tom calls them visitors rather than tourists, but I, 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 I look at a tourist being any, anybody that doesn't have a 30180 zip code. Now, I will agree that, that, they're, that the people that go into the motels and hotels around here, I love to have them and I am all for doing all we can for them. But to think that this body can't do that with just an occasional input or a monthly input from somebody, from the, the motels, or the restaurants. You know, we all use these restaurants. We are aware here, here what all of them are. The, the first restaurant that really took a chance on Villa Rica was Umberto. Umberto. Mm -hmm. And then we had Loic and Emily Colon. And, and then, then, then we had Gabe. And now we've got the other side. We have some good restaurants mm -hmm. that, that, that have worked hard to draw people and we have helped them out probably more than they realize because you saw some of the tax breaks up here that that we helped to generate to get those things e either purchased or operating so i just if we're going to split it definitely needs to be heavily focused on what we have now with the ability to expand to what we would like to have, not start out with what we would like to have and then take care of what we've got. You know, my philosophy has always been that persistence and a plan is what's important. And sometimes it takes years for that plan to finally work its way through. 30 years ago, half of, half of Villa Rica was empty literally empty and we started working on it slowly 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 recruiting people encouraging people uh, some of us spent our own resources on it but it has been a slow go it's just like eating an elephant you know you eat it one bite at a time but it seemed like over the last 30 years every time we had a change in city administration we got a new zookeeper and they ran in a new elephant on us. So you just can't start eating a bigger elephant every four or five years. It takes 30 years to do it. So all I'm saying is that if we split, we need to focus on initially what we've got with uh, the ability to bring in what we would like. And we do, I mean, my marketing, is for what we have now. Um, I think when I started here, on court was just the wine boutique. I think with the growth in the tourism that we have had, that that helped them to move forward into having a restaurant. Uh, restaurant. And we didn't even have the Holiday Inn. So I think well, we, we're still focusing on what we have now, but we still also have to look toward the future and and keep moving because every year just try to grow that's i don't want to stay the same you know all the time I, I always want to grow even professionally um and i like to see i've seen so much growth in this city since i've been here on 2016 when i started there are a lot of stuff in here that here now that wasn't there at all i mean and i remember driving up and thinking oh what am i gonna sell because i didn't i didn't think i had anything to sell but we just kept chugging along and things kept growing. The city kept growing and business kept growing and people kept coming. And I think the more people keep coming, the more growth we're going to see. Um, I think a vibrant downtown includes restaurants and boutiques. And all of the downtowns that I've seen, I, I, they, they, they got restaurants, they got, they got a lot more restaurants, but some boutiques as well. So, I mean, that's just a whole part of people coming in tourists coming to, to your downtown they want to see they want to walk they want to walk and they want to shop and they want to eat so 
And they want to park. And they want to park. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely want to park. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But, okay. All Any right. Any more comments? I was going to ask, uh, is, so are you, is your plan to take our information that we just discussed today and work on something substantive yeah, for us to vote on or? I talk, we, we meet every week with Tom, so. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think we'll have to come up with some kind of bylaws, some kind of structure of how we, how it should be, you know, the type of members that are on it that we could vote on to, right. cause I definitely agree that I mean, we need lodging, restaurant, retail, all that. I like the way that Douglasville does that, the different types of businesses that they have. And I'm looking at us here on this board, nothing against us, but we're not any of those things. Um, so, or well, retail, we got the one retail here. One retail. <laughs> yeah. Historic retail. And then an attorney and a lawyer and, and a Bill who just knows everything. <laughs> so, because he's, because he's been here so long. So we've got the history. Um, I've, I've also got interest Downtown. Oh yeah, and he's got yeah. I'm not yeah. Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, from the yeah from the um, owning property in downtown and such too. But um, but I think we we need that some kind of bylaws that show what the makeup should be, um, and then we can start putting people in those places. So you want you want the attorney to give you a guideline, mm. the city attorney to kind of give y'all some guidance on the makeup. Well, we need. Uh, I think we've got, we just need something presented that um, would be the bylaws, the beginning of the bylaws for the CVB so that okay. we could vote a on it. To, to okay. vote on, I think, and to review yeah. and vote on. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and we can't just vote on, hey, let's split them up without knowing what we're splitting yeah, into. Exactly. And I guess the other thing is, I, had the, I forgot to ask about this earlier, but is, is our current CVB a 5016C6? Is it, it is, isn't it, Carl? Mm -hmm. It is okay. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because it had to be. That's we yeah, set that's it up right. that way because okay. it had to be to be a CVB. And then you know, do we need a council resolution to if we're going to follow the Douglasville model, where I guess they put it in their ordinance? I don't know. I mean, and that could be a legal thing for for council is to let us know what's the they feel is the most appropriate way to organize it. If it's already an independent body at a 501c6. Yeah. Well, it has to be structured as a 501c6. Yeah. Right, yeah. but then like, so do we need like, like the Milledgeville did not have, there was nothing in the Milledgeville ordinances that refer to it, but Douglasville's ordinance basically has an ordinance that created it, but it didn't appear they had any bylaws. I've got a question. Uh, Ellen has a question. Oh, we forgot hey, Ellen was there. <laughs> Yeah. Which did you? Are you are you muted? Did you you may have yourself muted. Are you muted, Ellen? Are you muted? No. Okay. Are you muted? Are you muted? Well, your volume turned all the way down. Yeah. Where's the turn up the volume on the laptop? Okay. Okay, did you try? We still can't hear you. I still can't hear you. My suggestion would be that you guys vote to split effective January 1. And my suspicion is, is that that's the only decision you're going to make and that everything else is going to be made by the mayor and council. That's my, that's my gut feeling sitting here listening to it. So the bylaws and all that stuff, I think are going to be put together by them if they're, if I had to venture a guess. And then that way y'all could continue to function for several months and then we could get whatever in place and then we would, the council would appoint a new group effective January 1. So that's, that's my suggestion. Is she typing? 
No. Okay. Janet's calling you, Ellen. Put the mic up there. I think that goes right along with what Tom was saying. Um, we just need to to make a decision to do it as of a certain date, like the one one January first, and then let whoever's going to develop the new bylaws get working on them. And but we've already made the decision that we're going to split, um, and then the city of Sir Council is going to have a lot of say in who goes on that board. So I make a motion that we split CVB off of uh, DDA into its own uh, separate board um, as of 1-1-2020. 1-1. 1-1-2021. Uh, one, one, Sorry, I, I'm doing taxes for 2019 <laughs> still. So as of 1-1-2021 one, one, um, with the uh, city developing the bylaws and the board makeup uh, to, to go into effect on that date. All right, got a motion to have a second. Oh. Ellen seconded. Ellen seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. I wasn't really sure if I should abstain or not in that vote, but. but. I guess we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. That's it. That's it. All right. All right. Move on to down number five. New business. No, uh, we already did new business. Oh, we moved that's it right. Up. All right. We done done that one. All right. Public comment. Item for each agenda. Executive session. Mm -hmm. Your motion to adjourn. Uh, move that we adjourn. Second. Tracy, maybe you'll get home before dark. <laughs> I hear you. Me too.